Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of Allah, the most gracious, ever merciful. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all, our dear viewers. Welcome to tonight's Talim um, lecture organized by the National Talim Department. Um, as always, with, we begin our program with the recitation of the Holy Quran. May I call on our brother, Barak Sahib, to um, give Talawat an English translation. A'uzu billahi minash shaytani rajim Bismillahi rahmani rahim Wajawazna bi bani Israel al bahr faat baghum firaun wa junudu baghiyun adwa hatta idha adrakah al gharq. قال آمنت أنه لا إله إلا الذي آمنت به بنو إسرائيل وأنا من المسلمين الآن وقد عصيت قبل وكنت من المفسدين فاليوم ننجيك ببدنك لتكون لمن خلفك آية وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ عَنْ آيَاتِنَا لَغَافِلُونَ Now the English translation. I seek refuge from Satan, the accursed. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, merciful. And we brought the children of Israel across the sea, and Pharaoh and his hosts pursued them wrongfully and aggressively, till when the calamity of drowning overtook him. He said, I believe that there is no God, but he in whom the children of Israel believe, and I am of those who submit to him. What? Now? While thou wast disobedient before this and wast of those who create disorder, so this day we will save thee in thy body alone, that thou mayest be a sign to those who come after thee, and surely many of mankind are heedless of our signs. Jazakallah. Um, that was a really good read, Salhavat, and I enjoyed that quite a lot. Um, tonight, we are privileged to have in our um, in our presence who is going to deliver a speech on um, the lost treasures of Egypt. Um, Mr. Mohammed Azhar Ahmadi Sahib, who is serving as the Tarbiyat Secretary for Gillingham Jamaat. Um, I have had um, lectures from Mr. Ahmadi before, and anyone who has would know that we are in for a really good trip today. Um, as always, you would have the opportunity to ask questions towards the end, the last 10 minutes. So if you do have any questions, feel free to type them into the charts and we will endeavor to uh, read, to present these to our, um, our lecturer today. And um, indeed, Mr. Mahmoudi, um, your audience, Jazakallah. Thank you very much. Auzubillahimineshshaitanirajim, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
Wakar Sahib, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, we can. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and messenger. So the title of my speech is The Lost Treasures of uh, Egypt. Uh, and there's a subtitle to it, which is uh, The Unparalleled Truth of the Holy Word of God, the Holy Quran. <clears throat> So you can see two photos in front of you. One is the uh, statues or colossi of Ramesses II at Abu Simbel, which is south, which are situated on uh, uh, south of Aswan, uh, which is a city in the south of Egypt. And these are actually right on the uh, Sudanese border. Actually, when they built the Aswan Dam, they had to uh, transport all of these. And the Aswan Dam was built in the 1950s. It was a great engineering feat for the benefit of the people of uh, Egypt, you know, uh, electricity and what have you, power. And these uh, colossi were actually moved to a different location. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see Queen Hatshepsut's uh, temple in the Valley of the Kings, a magnificent building. And both these are more than 3,000 years old, about 3,200 years old. And why these are important to us as Muslims is because they attest to the unparalleled truth of the Holy Quran. And, uh, you know, some uh, signs of God Almighty are quite apparent. Uh, the sun, the moon, the, uni the spectacular universe we, w we live in, but some are hidden. And uh, God Almighty himself is far of far and beyond of beyond. And obviously his signs are also going to be of that nature. Just as when you go to the sea, there is the sea which brings great joy and comfort and pleasure to those who bathe in it and uh, put their feet in the cold water. But there are some divers who dive deep into the depths of the ocean and find out about various organisms and reefs and uh, some uh, take out jewels which are called pearls from the sea. So there's great difference and both when you go to the sea are the work of God Almighty. Mm. So this is going to be a journey I hope uh, into the hidden treasures of Egypt, into the hidden signs of God Almighty into the hidden truth of the Holy Quran. So Egypt, I'll just give you an overview, is uh, there's the map and uh, you see Cairo at the top, uh, which is the capital next to it is Giza. Giza is where most of the pyramids are. And uh, Egypt is a very special land because as you can see, most of it is desert. And most of the habitation is obviously around the Nile, which flows all the way from uh, East Africa, Lake Victoria, and uh, downstream and uh, near Alexandria, it uh, um, throws its, uh, its water and we call it the Nile Delta. But if you carry on, so the pyramids are situated in Giza, which is in Cairo. And uh, if you go south, uh, um, you will see a place called Luxor. Now Luxor is where you have the, uh, is, a, is, is a great 
uh, site of architectural uh, beauty um, and historical importance where you see a lot of the um, monuments and the artifacts and the riches of the pharaohs and then you have the valley of the kings you can see right next to it so the pyramids and the sphinx at giza the temples of Ramesses and karnak at luxor the valley of the kings also at luxor the towering colossi of abu simbel which you can see here south of aswan's high dam also islamic cairo and I'll give you a picture of Islamic Cairo. And you have the bazaars of Cairo. Also Islamic Cairo, grand mosques in Abbasid and Mamluk columns, winding alleyways from Arabian nights. And bazaars dripping with perfumes spices, rugs, and mother-of-pearl treasure chests, brimming with pearls from Arabia, incense from India, silks, China. Welcome to Egypt. Welcome to the greatest show on earth. Egypt's history is unmatched. It is 5,000 years, and much of it is on display. There are other great civilizations, but Egypt's is best preserved and colossal. Huge temples, towering statues. In the pyramids, the Valley of the Kings, the towering colossi, the mummies, the innumerable museums. So just to tell you something about Cairo, it has a population of 9.5 million. Uh, Egypt has a population of 100 million. You might have heard that in the Muslim countries, there is a, uh, um, I don't know whether we should call it a problem or an issue or uh, uh, just the fact of a population explosion. So these population in, uh, in um, Muslim countries are going up and up. Uh, let's see what the future holds. Um, so um, now I mentioned that the pyramids are not far from Cairo and oh here's another scene okay here's another map of uh, historical Egypt you can see the pyramids at the top Giza near Cairo and then as you come south uh, which is upriver you will see other monuments and you will see Luxor and the Valley of the Kings. So here you have the Nile, a picture of the Nile. Uh, I think this is at Luxor, you can see the columns and uh, you can see some mosques, uh, which is uh, quite a beautiful uh, uh, scenery, especially for us Muslims. Uh, now, here you have the magnificent pyramids and uh, apparently there are 118 of them. Many of them are small, but some of them are large. Uh, now, they go back to 4,820 years old. Uh, many of them are Giza uh, and uh, the youngest one is probably 2,000. 600 no that's the oldest one 2620 bc which would make it 4820 years old so we're talking about uh you know the earliest civilizations of man and if you look up closer to the great pyramid at giza you can see the horseman uh in the foreground and you can see the uh, uh, the dimensions and how the boulders have been uh, stacked up. So the Great Pyramid, which is the biggest pyramid at Giza, is, is comprised of 
2.3 million boulders. It took 20 years to be built and uh, 20 to 30,000 workers. But these are historical records and uh, I think some scholars are saying that uh, it didn't require so many workers, but uh, that is for people or viewers to follow up if you, because there are many studies done on this thing. So there's a, a very, uh, one of the oldest one is in Saqqara, in the same environs of Giza. And uh, you can see this is quite rudimentary and uh, quite uh, uh, things developed because these uh, pyramids, I mean, they've spread over thousands of years. They weren't all built together. So what were the pyramids? I think uh, most of us know that these were the inside journey to the afterlife. This is preparation by the pharaohs. They believed in uh, an afterlife. Uh, so I suppose they're a bit like us in that uh, respect. But the way they prepared for the afterlife is quite uh, unlike us Muslims. We are told to uh, uh, shed away your uh, ornaments and your material possessions and um, you will take nothing with you. They believed exactly the opposite. So they stuffed the pyramids. There were chambers and there were uh, loads of ornaments and even food and drink in special, uh, um, what shall I say, packaging. So it didn't rot for too long. Um, and obviously their thrones and clothes and uh, furniture and, uh, and, uh, and uh, as you can see, there are also air shafts so that the poor guy who was dead in the middle of the pyramid could breathe, I suppose. And there are also some subterranean chambers. So quite a lot of work has been done. Uh, now, this is the inside. You can actually, if you go to the Giza, if you go to Giza and visit the pyramids, you can actually go into some of these uh, chambers, and you can see uh, this is quite a narrow passageway. But it's some of them are open to the public, and some of them are being renovated all the time. And uh, but you can also you, you can easily go in into one of them. Um, now, just as a matter of interest, Cairo or Egypt has a large Moronite, no, sorry, not Moronite, Copt, Coptic uh, population. Copts are Arabs or some kind of Arabs, but uh, they, they don't call themselves Arabs, but they speak Arabic and um, they're Christians. And uh, we are interested in that because one of the wives of the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Here's a photograph of uh, Coptic Christians, their elders. It seems from the early 20th century. So one of the wives of the Holy Prophet, as you know, was from these people. So they are blessed in that respect. And when I visited Egypt, I was uh, very heartened to see that the Copts are uh, respected very much and their uh, priests are treated with a great amount of respect so that even if uh, people see a Coptic priest in the street they will go up to him and uh, greet him so this is a great example of uh, Muslim kind of tolerance and respect of other faiths um, which needs to be emphasized in these days of intolerance and bigotry by some Muslim scholars in some countries. So now we have seen the Valley of the Kings. Sorry, we have seen the um, pyramids in Giza near Cairo. Now here, as you travel on the River Nile and go towards south, upstream towards the source, you come to the Valley of the Kings and this is a good picture of the Valley of the Kings. So we have 63 pharaohs who are buried here. And um, I suppose it's not difficult to find out 
why they moved from pyramid building to valleys because pyramids are very expensive to build. As you can see, these, um, these tombs or chambers created in valleys are much uh, uh, easier, less effort. And also apparently the pyramids were not very safe because of the known amount of treasures in them. There have been robber robberies over the centuries and pyramids apparently not very safe and these uh, Valley of the Kings far safer. Um, maybe they had uh, more concrete boulders or, or whatever in front of them. So here are some pictures of the Valley of the Kings and uh, you can see the uh, the midday sun shining brightly on the sands of Egypt and the rock faces. And here on the right hand side is the magnificent uh, temple of Queen Hatshepsut, which is, and, uh, which is uh, 3,500 years old from today. It is dated about 1,470 BC. So these were very powerful. The pharaohs were very powerful rulers. As you can see in the Valley of the Kings, uh, in Luxor, the old name for it is Thebes in ancient literature. Uh, this is the Valley of the Kings. And you see the um, colossal ubiquitous statues of Ramses II. Uh, in fact, Ramses II is the pharaoh to whom, in whose house, household, uh, the prophet Moses salam, was reared. I'm sure you know the story. And uh, he, in fact, was a king, uh, the greatest king, they say the greatest pharaoh the mightiest, uh, well, he's got the most statues anyway. And all these statues which you can see are all his, even the two um, which, the two on the right, which adorn the entrance to the temple, they're both his. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, so this is Ramses the second who lived about 3,200 years old uh, ago, 3,200 years ago. He lived for 90 years, actually. And um, uh, so he was a very old, and this is why the, it's a very long story of Hazrat uh, Moses, alayhi salam, and I heard Hazrat Khalif the Masih the fourth when he commented on this saying that uh, because I think uh, Hazur had a research team looking into all this because it has uh, great reference to the Holy Quran. So he lived for 90 years. And remember, Moses had to um, leave. He had to go into exile because he punched somebody and was uh, charged and had to leave the country. And then he came back after many years and uh, so this was all happening in the time of Ramses the uh, second. Now uh, we can see the inside of one of the chambers in the Valley of the Kings. So uh, as you can see the walls, there's a lot of work being done, beautiful work. And uh, the tomb is beautiful as well. And if you look closer, Look at the, if I can say, look at the quality of wallpaper they have, <laughs> except it's not wallpaper. It's taken people, uh, you know, many years to write all this up and make the paintings and the drawings. So also in the Valley of the Kings, uh, we discover uh, 19, if I can just, take you to this moment in 1922 when Howard Carter uh, 
a British archaeologist discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun or King Tut as he's known now and this uh, has brought enormous riches and the quality of the workmanship you can see here is and to imagine that this is 3200 years old his throne and his death mask actually this is a death mask because he died young at the age of 19. Uh, people said he was bashed on the head in a temple murder uh, but that is being rejected that theory and uh, he died uh, of a chariot accident he hurt his he broke his leg and his pelvis and didn't seem to recover but uh, anyway the thing about why Egypt has enthralled visitors and populations over the centuries is the absolute beauty of the artwork which is found there so you can imagine putting this this uh, death mask in any museum in Europe or America or Japan those countries who can afford these kind of things even for display and it will be an absolute sellout no work of art in the Western world even Mona Lisa or Renoir or Turner can compare to King Tut's death mask which is 3200 years old and uh, it is residing in the Cairo Museum and so it was a great discovery which great, brought even greater attention this is his uh, uh, his coffin or they call it uh, it's that word which I always find difficult to pronounce anyway here is another bust of King Tut. You can see his eyes. And uh, this is the redoubtable Mr. Carter, great British um, excavator, archaeologist. And here he is in the 1900s, uh, no, 1920s, doing his work. They found some chariot which is being transported and another work of great beauty which is found is the bust of Queen Nefertiti which is now in the Berlin Museum so <clears throat> you can see the beauty again this is over 3,000 years old uh, and uh, there are many copies of these made but uh, it would be difficult to come up with in the original of such magnificent beauty and it is over 3000 years old so uh, actually the discovery of Egypt is quite a story in itself and I want to go into it as well uh, so historians I think I've shown you most of these slides I had and so the historians start the discovery of Egypt because all these things were hidden in fact if I can take you to some of these great temples these two temples much of these were hidden as well why because they were covered in uh, earth up to what length i don't know but they had to excavate all these temples because you know the nile as it flows it throws its uh, silt or, or earth onto the banks and everything and there's a lot of um, no dredging in those days uh, and so all these had to be dug up so you know let's say two three hundred years ago none of this was visible or very little of it 
So all these have come to light in the last, you know, since the 1850s. So now we still haven't come to the uh, mummy of the of Ramses II or his son Manapata, but we'll come to that later because Ramses II was the uh, pharaoh to whom um, um, Moses approached, but he was not the one who actually drowned in the Red Sea. It was his son Manapata uh, who actually pursued Moses and he died and he was killed. So the history of the discovery of Egypt, and you can see one iconic moment there, Howard Carter, 1922, uh, discovering this, can you imagine? And this, and this throne. Uh, so, begins with, uh, so the, the current history of Egypt, how it was discovered, how all these things were discovered, begins with Napoleon, his um, um, conquest of Egypt, 1898, over a period of three years to 1901. And it's interesting, so this is uh, Napoleon again. Uh, it's interesting what he said now he had to do it because he had a hump with the British and uh, he uh, and with the Ottomans and uh, whatever the historical reasons were, uh, we don't need to go into that. But Napoleon's proclamation on his conquest of Egypt in 1798 read, to the people of Egypt, you have nothing to fear. I come to restore your rights. I revere the Holy Quran and the Prophet Muhammad Napoleon, um, and if I can just read on. <clears throat> oh, sorry. He said, um, he said to his troops, the people amongst whom we are going to live are Mohammedans. The first article of their faith is this. There is, there is but one God and Muhammad is his prophet. Do not contradict them. Behave to them as you behaved in the in the Jews, as you behave towards the Jews and the Italians. Pay respect to their muftis and their imams, as you did to the rabbis and the bishops. Extend to the ceremonies prescribed by the Quran and the mosques the same tolerance and respect which you showed to the synagogues, to the religion of Moses and Jesus Christ. And he said to the people of Egypt, his proclamation, people of Egypt, you will be told by our enemies that I have come to destroy your religion. Believe them not. Tell them that I have come to restore your rights, punish your usurpers, which were the Ottomans, and name and raise the true worship of Muhammad, he should have said Allah. Tell them that I venerate more than do the Mamluks, God, his prophet, and the Quran. So anyway, we can read on in history books what happened. But why this is interesting to us is because Napoleon seems to have been enthralled by Egypt. And as the emperor of France, he commissioned a study of uh, everything Egyptian, uh, especially the history and the artifacts and the pyramids and Luxor and what have you, also the, the land and the landscape and the fauna and flora. And this culminated in a 24 volume description of Egypt, description de l'Egypt. Uh, and it's it's got Napoleon's name on it, Napoleon Le Grand. And there we have part of the great volume of work which was produced by the scholars. 160 scholars apparently were used, historians, archaeologists, 
engineers uh, who studied all this and produced this. And this apparently uh, whetted the appetite of Europeans more towards finding out about Egypt. And there was a great craze about Egyptology, just as I think in the 1970s, when King Tut's uh, uh, death mask was being displayed at the British Museum, there was great fanfare. And you could see in the tubes and the stations, um, you know, postcards of his uh, mask and the people were uh, were greatly enthralled and they bought books um, about King Tut and Egypt and what have you. So this started a, a, a great craze about Egypt and what have you. And a lot of scholars came up and obviously they were interested in more than anything else to decipher the hieroglyphics which is the Egyptian system of writing. Now, by the way, this uh, writing, which you can find on uh, uh, in, in, inside the pyramids and in Luxor and uh, inside the temples and everywhere, are uh, these are commissioned by the pharaohs, by the kings and queens, uh, and they depict battles and weddings and religious ceremonies. And uh, apparently this system of hieroglyphics has um, over 700 characters. I mean, our, uh, our alphabet has 26. And even if you add the numbers to it, one to 10, that's 36. But they had over 700. Um, so now, but the thing is this, people couldn't understand what was being what was written until a lot of work was done by uh, by Egyptologists and the um, the accolade for having uh, broken the code of hieroglyphics is given to a young Frenchman by the name of Jean Jean Francois Champollion. 1790 to 1832. So he died at the age of 41, very young. But he is, you can see his notebook on the right hand side, great, uh, apparently uh, brilliant mind. At the age of 16, he was uh, given entrance into the Hall of Fame, or, you know, this, uh, this society of uh, whatever they call it, I forget the name. Um, and uh, here's another example of his book. And he's given the uh, accolade of having deciphered the Rosetta Stone, which uh, resides at the moment in the British Museum. And um, actually it's just, uh, uh, it's not such a big deal, the Rosetta Stone, as far as the pharaohs are concerned, it is, uh, um, the uh, pharaonic uh, edicts about certain admin matters. And um, so one thing I will say about uh, these artifacts, which are lying in uh, museums, uh, mainly in Europe, uh, North America, uh, also Japan, I suppose, and uh, a few other rich countries, uh, is that uh, the Egyptians are not that bothered because when we come, okay, now let's go here to the Egyptian museum. Okay, I'll leave that comment for a little while, but I'll just say that historians uh, have said that in fact, the discovery of Egypt would not have been possible without two things, modes of transport in the 1850s. One is the steamships, which were discovered in the early 19th century and then began to, so this is not only travel uh, within Egypt on the Nile, but to Egypt uh, and also the railways, which were first started in 1836 in Britain and then uh, 
were used all over the world. And uh, the one on the right is the Egyptian railway, which is in 1856. So all these things, as you can see, are combining Napoleon's uh, conquest, the craze about Egyptology, uh, hieroglyphics, um, and then the modes of transport making things easier. And things are coming to a head. So we have a lot of scholars pouring their minds over Egyptology. Uh, so a lot of artifacts being discovered both in the mainly two places. One is the, uh, the pyramids and Giza. And secondly is the Valley of the Kings. So uh, you can see you we've we've been through Howard Carter's. Now a lot of these discoveries were commissioned because the Egyptian uh, locals were not able to. I think there was a lot of illiteracy around. Uh, so people from Europe came, and the treaty was, or the deal was that fine, you can uh, we'll give you. Uh, from the Brit from the Egyptian government will give you uh, permission to uh, dig up these tunnels or whatever only this pyramid or only this valley and uh, we will keep 90 percent and you'll keep 10 percent or whatever the agreement was I'm sure there was a lot of arm twisting going on as well so but you know let's leave that for one side but anyway so a lot of these treasures which are found in Europe, are also, you know, those uh, legally obtained ones, because obviously uh, explorers like Howard Carter are not going to go there for free. You know? So there has to be some kind of commercial. And now, as far as the Egyptians are concerned, the great uh, pyramid, the, the great artifacts are housed in this building, which is the Cairo Museum, uh, which was built in 1901, and it has 120,000 artifacts and more in storage so that some of them have never seen the light of day since they were discovered, the 1850s, 60s, 70s. So obviously, you're, you know, uh, Egypt is a poor country. It can't afford museums and uh, what have you. Uh, you can see the inside of this magnificent, which is French, uh, designed and constructed museum, uh, some of the artifacts. Uh, and like I said, so many of these artifacts are in storage. So the Egyptians are not really worried about all the artifacts being displayed in Europe and America and other places. Actually, the so now they have a new museum and you can see the new museum, which is a near completion. The date is November 2022. Uh, and again, you can see the huge colossal uh, colossus statue of uh, Ramses II there. So they built a new museum and uh, now the, the, um, the governor of the new museum or the director has said, that all these other uh, uh, statues and artifacts, Egyptian artifacts in, in Europe, you know, they can keep them because they're good advertisement for, uh, for, uh, for Egypt and it encourages tourism. Um, and they're not really bothered about them being returned, which is quite different to the Elgin marbles of, of, of Greece, if you remember because the Greeks are quite adamant they want them back, but not the Egyptians because they've got so much. Uh, so once again, we go to, this is Abu Simbel, Ramses II. Uh, now his tomb, now we can see that the Valley of the Tomb, Valley of the Kings is being excavated. Uh, so the mummy of Ramses II, was discovered in 1881. Uh, this is 3,000 years after the event, 3,200 years. And um, you can see here as well, the mummy of Ramesses II in the, it's, 
in the Cairo Museum, 3,200 years old, the time of Prophet Moses, and also the his son, as I said, he's the one who was drowned. Now his mummy is also, his was discovered in 1898 in, in uh, again, the Valley of the Kings, and that is also in the Cairo Museum. And uh, here we are. This is where, the, this is the tomb of Manepata, great biblical and Quranic figure. And this is the outside, and on the left is the inside. So, again, we have a scene here of Mr. Howard Carter, but he was not the only one. There were others as well. So, I will just say, <clears throat> I'll just say this. <clears throat> the Holy Quran, which was revealed 1,800 years after the drowning of the Pharaoh takes up this tale of oppression and emigration and explains Pharaoh's doom. As we listen to the recitation of the Holy Quran, it says, and it says, when he was about to drown, Pharaoh submitted to God and he said, I believe in the God of Moses. And God's reply was, what now? while you were disobedient before this and made mischief. So this day we will save thee in thy body alone as a sign for people who can who come after thee. And surely mankind is heedless of our signs. So God at that moment announced that he would save his body, but not his soul. Now no other historical record exists of the fate of Pharaoh. The Old Testament is entirely silent on the matter. But the Holy Quran picked up the subject 1,800 years after it happened. Chapter 10 is a Meccan surah revealed in the last five years, which places it circa 607 AD or 1,810 years after the drowning. The tomb of Rameses II was discovered in the Valley of the Kings in 1862 and that of his son Manapata also in the same valley in 1898. Ramses II was the oppressor of the Israelites whom the Prophet Moses salam, approached with divine warnings, but it was the succeeding king, his son Manapata, who pursued Moses to the Red Sea. So the bodies of both Ramses II and Manapata were discovered 3,000 years after Manapata's drowning. Manapata perished in 1203 BC and his body was discovered in 1898. That makes it 3,101 years. Let us consider the course of history. An event happens 3,000 years ago but is not mentioned anywhere in any historical or religious text. The ravages of time cover up all possible evidence for 3,000 years. Napoleon's invasion in 1798, his 24-volume Studies of Egypt, his countryman Champollion breaks the code of the hieroglyphics in 1822. Only then does modern man appreciate the secrets of the pyramids and tombs, the advent of steamships and railways. Archaeologists come from Europe to dig the Egyptian earth. Temples are discovered, some buried 50 feet under the Nile's silt and sand. Many of the treasures already raided long ago, but lo and behold, the bodies or mummies of the pharaohs are unearthed, intact. And the pharaohs which we are concerned about, Ramses and Manapata, they are safe from Roman and raider and sand and 3,000 years, exactly as the Holy Quran had prophesied. The Holy Quran itself had described the event of the drowning 1,800 years after it had occurred. It mentions that the Pharaoh's body was preserved, but this was not unearthed until 1898. 
some 1,200 years later. Is it not wondrous that it was Christian archaeologists, Christian Egyptian hieroglyphic uh, students, Christian scientists who have dug up the mummies? If Muslims had made these findings, some unkind observer may have remarked that the evidence had been twisted by the Muslims to serve their ends. But the Christian scientists and archaeologists have stamped their own independent, irrefutable verdict on the facts as laid out in the Holy Quran. Which human being can look back 2000 years, pick on a remote event, which is not reco recorded in any historical or scriptural annals and describes exactly what happened. And in fact, this narration of the Holy Quran in fact remain hidden for a further 1,200 years. The mummies of the two pharaohs, both have been found for good measure, lie in Egypt's National Museum at Cairo. Their provenance attested to independently by Christian efforts and Christian scientists, a testament to the undeniable truth of the Holy Quran. Who can deny that the Holy Quran's claim that it is divinely revealed? Who can deny that the Holy Quran demands respect of the very highest order? The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, received the verbal revelation, which is the glorious Quran, over a period of 23 years. The Holy Prophet وسلم, said, I am not the author. These are not my writings. It is the blessed word of God Almighty. It is verbal revelation vouchsafed to me through the angel Gabriel from God eternal, who is all seeing, all knowing. Now, can anyone doubt this claim? The promised Messiah writes, <clears throat> Let it be known that the most outstanding beauty of the Holy Quran is that boundless sea of deep wisdom, those solid facts, those avenues of Quranic knowledge so rich in philosophy, which we can manifestly present to all nations and all peoples, be they Indians, Persians, Europeans or Americans. The Holy Quran is a perfect miracle the like of which never was and never will be. It is the very light of God Almighty. It is a treasure chest, but few are those who are aware of it. In conclusion, we say peace and blessings on the messenger of God, وسلم, to whom the Holy Quran was vouchsafed and who delivered it safely to us and praise is to God eternal, the majestic author of a majestic book. Thank you very much for your time. Jazakallah, um, Muhammad Sahib. Um, I was um, not surprised at all with the detail as well as the amount of rich knowledge you have given us tonight. Um, Miala, bless you for your time and obviously your expertise and um, and the delivery of the lecture. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'll now hand over to um, Wakarsa to um, to continue for the second session. Jazakallah. 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 Uh, as I said, mashallah, uh, your lecture, as expected, has um, been praised very highly by our viewers. who are all um, very grateful and appreciative of your great knowledge and insights uh, into the, the lost treasures of Egypt um, and viewers commenting on this being a captivating lecture, uh, very informative um, and, and an extremely scholarly discourse. So Jazakumullah Asna Jazar for your uh, sharing your expertise on this um, very uh, inspiring topic tonight. Um, we obviously have had more compliments than questions, but there is one question uh, if we can put to you, please. Uh, and the question is, is it significant 
that the discovery of the drowned Pharaoh's body in the time of Musa alayhi salam uh, that took place in the age of the promised Messiah alayhi salam? Um, well, the, the age of the promised Messiah alayhi salam is obviously the latter days and it could only happen now because as I said, it couldn't happen without technology, without uh, the steamships and the railways. And remember the steamships and the railways, these modes of transport are also uh, prophesized in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. that these would be the signs of the latter days and the times of the promised Messiah. So I think uh, the questioner is right. And this is the age when the earth throws up its treasures to show us the might of the truth of the Holy Quran and the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and also his illustrious servant um, and Ghulam, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadiyan. So I think they are very much related, but this is only my opinion. I mean, I can't say it as a fact. As a sub, that was the only question that we had. Uh, and just to reiterate um, the uh, the great uh, compliments that viewers have, have had. Did you have uh, many viewers, by the way? Mashallah, yes. We are always <laughs> uh, very um, um, delighted with the with the viewers that we have. Um, so, Mashallah, I know that this lecture will be passed on and circulated very widely uh, with anyone with a passing interest in Egyptology, I think. Um, so, Mashallah, it's a great resource for our department. Jazakallah. Asana Jazakallah. I think we um, have only two minutes. Uh, can I just uh, have a comment, if you don't mind? Or Please do, yes. So, uh, if uh, people are interested in Egyptology and they are uh, 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 they are excited to go to Egypt to find out about the truth of the Holy Quran and this, uh, uh, as I said, the new Egyptian museum is due to open in um, November 2022. So it might be a good idea to let, to delay your enthusiasm until then. But uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, delays with it because this is a huge project. And uh, so let us hope it it, uh, it finishes on time and that we can all go and uh, see the magnificent Egyptian new museum. Jazakallah. I think that would be very useful for you to give a, a follow-up lecture as well. I think once the museum is, uh, is is inaugurated, I think you're the perfect person to invite back for that purpose. Um, so just a reminder to our viewers that our lectures return next week. Uh, Urdu lectures will take place on Monday evenings at the new time of 7 o'clock. And our English lectures will take place uh, on Tuesday evenings again at 7 o'clock. Next Tuesday, inshallah, we'll be going from Egypt to Saudi Arabia. Uh, with a lecture by Shahid Khan Saib, also of Jilingam Jamaat, uh, who will be talking about his Umrah experience, inshallah. So we look forward to that lecture as well. Uh, just leave for me to now request our respected speaker this evening, Azhar Ahmadi Saib, to please lead us in a silent prayer. Uh, uh, please join me in silent prayers. Amin. Amin. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.